either we're really nervous about today or uh, we're not awake yet. Come back at 1040. Well, welcome to the week that some of you have been waiting for and others of you have been dreading. We're going to talk about sex in church. Um, we live in a sex-saturated society because sex sells. Um, and sex sells because it's a core piece of who we are as human beings. God created us as sexual beings with all the desires that every one of us feels. And we all feel them. It's why Fifty Shades of Grey became a number one bestseller trilogy. They tapped into the sexual side of God's creation took it a direction I'm not sure it should have gone. We're going to refer a lot uh, to marriage today. Uh, that doesn't mean if you are single that this doesn't apply to you. Uh, I believe it does. God created us as sexual beings, and whether married or single, how we handle sex is something we must get right in order to build healthy, God-honoring relationships. So I want you throughout this morning to, to pray for me. Because I'm sure I'm going to get tongue-tied at some point today. Uh, and I'm sure I will say something that will lead our minds and our thoughts somewhere I did not intend them to go. And I hope we will all laugh about it. Uh, because that will be healthy and that will be good. I'll stick to my notes a little bit more uh, for that very reason. Would you pray with me? God, we today uh, submit ourselves to you. And... Uh, God, we ask you to help us hear from your Spirit today. To help us to make it through this life that so wants to twist this gift. God, we pray that our bodies would be sacrifices to you and not to our own indulgences as the world would like us to. God, help us today and pour out your spirit upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> let's, start, let's start here. Where, you, where do you start, huh? How to impress your wife. You ready for this list? <laughs> Compliment her. Cuddle with her. Kiss her. Caress her. Love her. Tease her. Not too much. Comfort her, protect her, hold her, spend money on her, dine her, buy things for her, listen to her, care for her, stand by her, support her, go to the ends of the earth for her, and you will impress your wife. Husbands, or how do you impress your husband? Show up naked. <laughs> That's pretty much the way it works. That's pretty much the difference. While we were waiting this past Tuesday for everyone to arrive at staff meeting, we uh, uh, began thinking out loud about this message, and we looked at Kyle, and we said, Kyle, what kind of songs are popping into your mind for this week? <laughs> well, I bet this has been interesting and fun. And we joked about some interesting possibilities that we didn't do, won't do, and won't share. Um, and, and, then we, and then we all thought uh, to ourselves, what are, what are some things that, that Jeff could say? And, and one of the best ones, I thought, was sex is surely alive and well at Cornerstone. Just walk into the nursery and you'll see all the babies. <laughs> you know, being able to joke about sex is a healthy thing if it's done in that kind of context. It's a, it's a part of who we are. I, I would never advocate one man talking to one woman about sex or vice versa, except, obviously, if you're married, then you should talk about it. Let me share with you some, some boundaries we have around Cornerstone that uh, I like to remind us as a church at least once a year um, because sex is so powerful and it can be used in, 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 in for such good but can also be twisted in such a way that, that evil can take over. And, and because of that, we, we try to be very careful. So let me just remind you about some of the things we as a staff have as boundaries, that I would say, you know, what are your boundaries? Uh, first of all, we, we talk about no male-female one-on-one meetings with a door closed, <laughs> nor at a time when nobody else is on campus. We just won't do it. 
It's not good. I always tell staff, have a photo or two or three of your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend on your desk in full view. Anybody walks into your office, they can see that. It's an important barrier. Um, uh, we talk about uh, don't pray with someone of the opposite sex one-on-one. -on -one. We just won't do it because prayer is one of the most intimate things you can do. Now, often, if I'm meeting with a woman in my office, doors open, all that stuff, and, and I, I know that it, man, I really, really need to pray, I will, I will ask, can I go find someone else to pray with us? And very often, there is someone who's, who's available. Remember, there's always somebody else on campus. Anyways, I also advocate sitting behind a desk or in clear view of an open door. One of the two. Never, never kind of around the corner, never in some place where there could be suspicion. It's important to have boundaries. Those are the kinds of barriers that we create because, because sex can, can destroy a life and it can destroy a ministry faster than anything else I know. So we're talking about filling a relationship toolbox. We're building our house over here. And uh, we talked about tearing down walls with forgiveness. We've talked about uh, putting the roof on so that we can move forward with wise choices, building that inside. Next week, we're going to talk about money. And the last one we're going to talk about is how to handle conflict. Sex is one of the most powerful drives in all of God's creation. It's, it's powerful enough to create a bond in marriage that can make it through the toughest of times. It's also powerful enough to destroy relationships and pervert our God-given purpose. Sex is not the answer to everything, although I might have personally advocated for that in God's creation. But on the other hand, I'm very grateful God didn't choose Pollination. <laughs> Think about that one for a minute. God created sex, and he has the knowledge about how it best works. That's what we're going to look at today. Sex is a vital part of our toolbox, because if we mess this up, it can destroy us. Even in a good marriage, sex must be handled well, figured out together to become what God created it to be. Again, sex is created by God. He states clearly that there is a physical complement between the sexes, male and female. Genesis chapter 1 says this. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God looked over all that he had made. A couple of verses later. And he saw that it was very good. This design was not a mistake, folks. It didn't happen by chance. There weren't some random molecules that suddenly got together and magically formed two human beings who just happened to fit together. Talk about having faith. Sex is so important that God actually dedicated an entire book to it in the Bible. Uh, Bible scholars believe that Proverbs 5, 18, and 19 was actually used as an outline and a launching pad for the entire book of the Song of Solomon. One of the most erotic books on the planet that's in our scriptures. Here's what Proverbs 5 says. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Another translation of that is intoxicated by her love. See, and because God made, such, made sex such an integral part of being human, I think Satan pays special attention to it. And so it becomes an extra sensitive temptation. And he uses it as a great, as a great weapon against us. <laughs> See, it, here's, here's where my theology goes. When Satan couldn't get at God, he got at the next best thing to God, which is God's creation. Creating the image of God we are. And, and then I believe Satan decided that in order to attack humanity uh, at the closest they are to God. Now, follow me for a moment here. The act of creation. God is known as the creator. 
And, and that, that act of sex, which is that creative act that he has given us, is perhaps Satan's greatest leverage. And if he can get that, he just probably can move our entire lives in a direction against God. We're going to use uh, the phrase today, sex that satisfies, as we move through this message. I, I don't mean it to say that the purpose of sex is uh, to get satisfaction. I, I mean it to refer to God's design for sex. Uh, when sex operates within God's created boundaries, it is satisfying. Otherwise, it is a moment of satisfaction and then emptiness, which is why the sex addict is never satisfied and needs more and more, but only feels emptier and emptier. So you've got some notes in your bulletin, and uh, you may want to follow along on those. Uh, I won't have us read any scripture today together, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, might, uh, might be helpful to, to take some notes. So here, here's the first thing. Sex that satisfies is exclusive. Sex that satisfies is exclusive. Here's what 1 Corinthians 7 says. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. This is God's plan for sex. It's a mutual giving of one to the other. Think of it in terms of a fireplace. Uh, when, a, when a fire is in the fireplace, it's safe. It, it's, it's surrounded. It's contained. It gives warmth. And it's pleasant to, 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 to sit by. Outside the fireplace, the fire becomes destructive. It destroys rather than provides. When we share our bodies with more than one partner, we are dividing what God intended to be single. The one who craves sex with someone other than their spouse is stepping outside the bounds of God's plans. It's literally playing with fire. In other words, sex that satisfies, you might think of it as discipline. God's design for sex and marriage is, is not intended to take away fun from our lives. I mean, I hear that a lot from people who aren't Christ followers. Well, you know, God's got all these rules and he's, and he's taking the fun out. No, what God knows is that premarital sex always leads to disappointing sex and marriage. Less than he intended. God's plan is that this most intimate of relationships takes place within the safety and the security, the exclusivity of a marriage covenant. Some of you may remember the movie City Slickers. Watch this little one-minute clip. What if you could have great sex with someone very attractive? And Bob would never find out. It's a big trap. I don't have to film. Girl came to his house, then she came to my house. Yeah. Let's say a spaceship lands. Good, reality. Are you listening to this? The spaceship lands and the most beautiful woman you ever saw gets out. And all she wants to do is have the greatest sex in the universe with you. Could happen. And the second it's over, she flies away for eternity. No one will ever know. You're telling me you wouldn't do it? No. And it's what you're describing actually happened to my cousin Ronald. And his wife did find out about it at the beauty park. They know everything there. <laughs> Forget it. Look, Ed, what I'm saying is it wouldn't make it all right if, if Barbara didn't know. I know. And I wouldn't like this. That's all. Pay attention, girls. We got strays. Hi, Curly. Kill anyone today? They ain't over yet. Culture approaches commitment like Ed, the first guy, looking for loopholes and ways to get around it. They feel trapped by their restraining commitment rather than empowered by their devotion to one another. The question then is not whether you or your mate are committed. Do you have the right kind of commitment? Sex that satisfies God says is exclusive within the fireplace of marriage. Here's the second thing. 
Sex that satisfies, according to the scripture, is a result of relationship. It's a result of relationship. Genesis 4.1 tells us this. And the man, referring to Adam, knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. The biblical word for sexual intercourse is know, to know. See, if the other does not feel known, then the sex will not be good. It will be a physical connection only, but not the deep satisfaction that God intends. Now, strangely, the best sex manual may be the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Look up intercourse, and here's what you find. You know how it has multiple definitions? Definition number one, connection or dealings with, between persons. <clears throat> connection or dealings between persons. Secondly, exchange, especially of thoughts or feelings. When I'm reading this, I'm going, that's pretty good. <laughs> Only third is physical sexual contact between individuals. Sex is the electricity of marriage. It, it, it's, it's the fire, but it's not the fuel. Sex is fueled by connection or by acceptance. In other words, sex does not set the atmosphere of a marriage. It is merely an indication of a healthy relationship. Sexual problems in a, in a marriage due to health or, may I say, mechanical issues, uh, creates a great amount of tension in the relationship. But those issues are different from a marriage where there is a refuser or a demander. Relationship is not the catalyst for sex in those cases, and the sex won't be satisfied. <laughs> a good way to remember it is that sex is more like a barometer measuring the atmosphere and not the thermostat to set the temperature of the relationship. Oh, how we'd like it to be sometimes, but it doesn't work. Mark chapter 10 says this, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. This cannot happen outside the covenant of marriage. In singleness, sex will distract a couple from building a healthy relationship. I can tell you story after story of people that I've, I've talked with or counseled with who, who, who have been active, active sexually outside of marriage, and, and it is the same pattern. When, when tension arises in the relationship, they run to sex, and they avoid building the healthy relationship. In a marriage, it's not so easy to get away. You've got to deal with it. Sex is one of the greatest and yet most awkward activities husbands and wives can engage in. A, a successful uh, sexual encounter will leave a couple relaxed and satisfied and thrilled to be in love. A couple who is in sync with each other sexually will be more confident and will think more clearly and, and, and will be more willing to, to sacrifice for the relationship. In many ways, a good marriage means, yes, good sex. Research actually says that married people have both more sex and better sex than single people do. Uh, so it, it, it's because of that commitment. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear the jokes about uh, lack of or boredom with married sex, but the research doesn't prove that out. Married couples are the most sexually satisfied people on the earth. Les and Leslie Parrott uh, write in their book the titled When Bad Things Happen to Good Marriages. Married people who attend church weekly are more likely to be sexually satisfied than married people with less traditional values. Marriage, as it turns out, does not douse the flame of passion. It is the very fan that flames our sexual fire. I have to admit there's a, an evangelism tactic I never thought of. <laughs> But it might work. Come to church for, well, we'll figure out that later. <laughs> Dr. Henry Cloud uh, wrote in his book, uh, Rescue Your Love Like This. 
Good sex is not expert sex, but rather sex where pe both people feel accepted right where they are and where the relationship feels okay right where it is, at whatever level of sexual health or competency it has. Good sex is failure-free sex. If you want a great sex life, then work on accepting each other in all areas of life, he says. When a person feels totally accepted by her lover, barriers go down in the entire person. It is the beginning of being naked and unashamed, and it translates into passion and sexual freedom. Yet judgment, performance anxiety, guilt, lack of forgiveness, and other unrealistic expectations out of your relationship and out of your sex life. Here's, a, here's an image to help us. Sex is like an easel upon which the relationship paints a picture of itself. If the relationship is loving, then the sex is going to be loving. If the relationship is self-centered, then the sex will be self-centered. If the relationship is connected, the physical experience will further the connection. But if the partners are detached from each other, the sex is in danger of being just a routine physical. Satisfying sex is the result of connected relationships. Here's the other thing. Sex that satisfies is an act of worship. It's an act of worship. Here's what Romans chapter 1 tells us and warns us about. When they professed themselves to be wise, they became fools. For they turned the glory of the incorruptible God to the similitude of the image of a corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore also God gave them up to their heart's lusts, to uncleanness, to defile their own bodies between themselves, which turned the truth of God into a lie, and now notice, and worshipped and served the creature, forsaking the creator, which is blessed for him. It gets flipped. It gets changed. Unless we understand that because God created sex, he not only knows how it best works, he also sees it as an act of worship. We are designed for worship. If we are not worshiping God, we are going to be worshiping ourselves, ultimately. Usually what happens is we worship the human body. It becomes our focus and mostly for the pursuit of pleasure. When we leave our creative purpose of worshiping the Creator, we will turn to worshiping creation, starting with us. And it is sexual sensation that gives us the greatest kick, self 